really is a pleasure to be here. So, good morning, Radiant City. Good morning. What's up? Hey. Buenos dias. Que volá? Que lo que? Hey, hi. Bon dia. Como vai? Sac passe. Did I say that right? All right, all right. Listen, listen, let me tell you. This is, it's a, it's a great pleasure to see so much diversity sitting in these seats. It's a beautiful thing to see. When I look out in these seats and I see so many people from different places, so, so many backgrounds, right, uh, different types of upbringings, it really is an earthly picture of a heavenly possibility. Right? This speaks to the heart of the Father and his, deci- his desire to see his disciples gathered and worshiping him in love with their hearts for one another. Right? We gather together to worship him. Right? That's the one common denominator. We can have all these different backgrounds, all this diversity, all these different languages, all these uh, socioeconomic, whatever you want to put before the, the Father, but what we have in common is we have one common Father, and we gather together to worship Him. But it stems from the love that we have for one another. Right? We gather together to love each other, serve one another, and it speaks to the love that we have for the Father. It all goes hand in hand. As a matter of fact, Jesus says in John chapter 13, verses 34 to 35, it says, A new commandment I give to you. That you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another. The main idea for this morning, if you're taking notes or if you just want to know where we're headed, we have been given different, we have been given different God-given gifts so that we could serve one another in love. We have been gifted for love. The way that we love one another in this beautifully diverse body of believers, of disciples and followers of Christ, will let the world know that we belong to Jesus. It's it's a testimony. The way we love one another allows others to know that we belong to one person. So I can look out at a family and see that they have many children. And then I see the father and the mother walk out and I say, oh, okay. All right, yeah, I see who you belong to. Or if I go to a family reunion and I'm with my cousins, there's no denying that we all have a common ancestry. We all come from the same tree. We're a part of the same body. So when you're a part of the same body of Christ, The way we love one another speaks a testimony to who we belong to. However, if we are turning our backs on one another, it also speaks to a broken and divided family. So the way we love one another carries a lot of weight. The way we serve one another carries a lot of weight. It's not just something we should just do on Sundays and leave and that's it. Because we have one common father, and we worship him together. So how does the way that we love one another let all the world know that we belong to Jesus? It really comes down to using our spiritual gifts. As individuals, we have these gifts that have been given to us by the Holy Spirit so that we can serve one another in a body as a whole. We've been gifted so that we can love each other well. In order for this to make sense, though, there has to be a switch that happens. I don't just wake up one morning, come to Radiant City, see Cody and his his wonderful family, and all of a sudden I just have this, this incredible desire to serve him and his family. It doesn't work that way. A change has to happen. By nature, I am a grump. By nature, I can get really cranky. If you come around me, you see that I like to joke around, but I can get grumpy real quick. Just ask my wife if you don't believe me. She'll turn and say, hey, why did you snap at me? And, and I, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize. I didn't mean to. And honestly, I don't even know why. It just kind of happens. But listen, when the switch happens, 
when that change happens in our heart, when the change happens in our mind, things start to change. I start to behave differently. I act differently. I walk differently. I engage differently. Why? Because one encounter changes everything. So we have to start at the beginning with Jesus to understand where we need to go. So we have this one encounter with Jesus. One encounter changes everything. So let's go ahead, before we dive into the text, I just want to go ahead and bathe this time and this message in the Holy Spirit so that he can take control over everything that is said. Amen? Let's go ahead and pray. Jesus, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for this time that we get to worship you together as part of one body. Lord Jesus, I ask you that you speak powerfully and profoundly through your word, that you minister to our minds and our hearts, that you move us and spur us in the direction that you want us to go. Holy Spirit, be loud, be clear, and bring conviction, Lord, so that we can be repentant and continue to glorify and exalt you together as one body, Lord. I ask you, Lord Jesus, that you help me move out of my own way so that the words that I speak are not my words, but they're yours. Lord Jesus, help me die to myself so that you overall are exalted. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's go ahead and dive into the text so we can see how all this works for individuals and the body of Christ. So we're going to be in Romans chapter 12. We're going to read from verses 1 through 8. We're gonna, I'm going to be, as I'm reading, I'm going to be breaking it down so we kind of understand what the text says so we can piece it all together as a whole. Amen? All right, so 12.1 says like this. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So Paul starts, starts out by saying, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, appeal, I urge, I plead, I exhort to you, therefore. Basically, Paul is saying, I beg of you, therefore. Well, what's therefore, therefore? Why is he saying therefore? What is the point? Paul, to sum it all up, is just saying, basically, because you have been saved, I appeal to you. Because you have been set apart, because you belong to Jesus now, I am calling on that. I appeal to you. I beg of you. I urge you. I'm pushing you. I'm pleading with you to do this now. By his mercies, by his mercies, by the mercies of God, not because I, Paul, command you to, but I'm calling on the mercy of God that now lives in you, that you understand. The fact that I did not deserve salvation, I deserve death. But God's mercy was bestowed on me. So he's calling on that same mercy. And he's saying, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable as a living sacrifice. Now, I'm not asking anybody to walk out here and start trying to offer yourself up to I-95. That's not what I'm saying. We're not, we're, it's sacrifice. This language is Old Testament language when you had to set a, a, a certain animal apart for a certain sacrifice, for a certain thing. Blood had to be shed. But you offered up the whole animal. God redeems us as a whole being, our whole person. Why? Because God loves the whole person, not just a part of you. God loves the whole person, so it makes sense for us to return the whole person to that love and offer our bodies up as a living sacrifice. Now I'm offering myself up to everything that I am to God. Am I perfect and without blemish? On earth I'm not, but in Christ I am. So I'm offering myself up as a living sacrifice. The important thing to understand here is that at this point, we no longer belong to ourselves, but we belong to God who redeems us. And it is our spiritual worship to offer ourselves up to him. Amen. I'm now, I'm casting myself at, at his feet. I'm at, the, I'm at the foot of the cross. I got nothing. I am it. This is all I have. Now, because we don't belong to ourselves, we're, call, we're called to a different standard now. When I own something, it is mine. I conform it to what I needed to be conformed to. So if I, if I get a car... Like when I was growing up, I had a Honda Civic, and I thought I was the lick. I thought I was it. I thought I was that guy, right? 
So I had dropped it. I tinted the windows. It wasn't fast, but it really did look fast. <laughs> but I conformed it to what I wanted it to look like. Why? Because it was my car. I owned it. Yes. Now, because God owns me, I'm on a different standard. I'm at a different level. I'm conformed to something else. I'm conformed to an image of Christ. Look at verse 2. Look at verse 2. It says, do not be conformed to this world. Uh, the, the Greek also says to this age, right, to this time, to this culture. Don't, keep, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. The surrender of our life is our responsibility. But the transformation of our life is God's responsibility. So I'm surrendering all that I am to God, but I'm surrendering the transformation to him. I'm letting him start to work. It happens a lot where I talk to people where they come to the feet of Christ and they're like, man, I just thought things were going to be easier now. Well, it's not because you're starting to recognize things that you didn't recognize before about yourself, about others, about the age that we live in. Even the people that proclaim to be Christians and how they live their lives, this starts to bother you. Why? Because you're being transformed in the renewing of your mind. You're thinking differently. You're you're being formed to a new standard. We have to allow ourselves to be led by the Spirit and think the way that the Spirit will have us to think. Now, at this point, you are now going to be able to test and discern what is the will of God? That what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, after Paul makes that introduction in chapter 12, we're able to understand verses 3 through 8. It'll now make sense because the renewing of the mind, it's like the cables have had to get, they were crossed and they had to get put right. Now I'm able to function properly. The way it's supposed to work, I'm able to get it now. And now we're faced with our first test. Let's look at verse 3. Let's read it together. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Notice, you offer yourself up as a living sacrifice. You have to be renewed You have to be transformed and renewed in your mind so that you can now think the way the Spirit wants you to think. But then Paul says, but you don't think so highly of yourself. Because when I was growing up, it was like, you are not all that in a bag of chips. Don't think so highly of yourself. Why? The renewed mind starts to think differently Don't think so highly of yourselves. In other words, there's no need for us to be proud because faith does not allow us to boast in ourselves. If we put our faith in Christ, if I put my faith in Jesus Christ, then we are saved by him and we boast by him, through him, because of what he's done. It's nothing that I've done. It's nothing that you've done. It's nothing that I can buy. It's nothing that I can work toward. It is literally putting my faith in Jesus and saying, now I'm boasting in you and what you've done, why I'm changed, why I can think differently, why I'm, forming to a, I'm being conformed to a different standard. Faith means that we now look away from ourselves and we look to Christ as our truth. And because God assigns different faith in different measures, Measures, it should drive us to become dependent on one another. So that part gets a little tricky. When I was studying this, I was like, I never really looked at the end of that verse, verse 3, where it says, with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So I got a little offended. God, you're giving me a different measure of faith than someone else? Don't we, aren't we all like on the level playing field? Shouldn't we all have the same faith? But the problem with that is, there are many days when my faith is weak. There, and there are many days when my faith is strong. Even in my 20 plus years of being a believer, there are times when my faith is very weak. It could be from one day to the It could be within hours where I wake up and I'm like, man, if a demon shows up, I'm biting. 
But an hour later, it's like, man, I can't believe this is going on. What happened? And I don't know. I don't see a, a light at the end of the tunnel right now. I don't know what's happening. And it draws me. It should drive me to be dependent on someone else's faith at that point. Listen, 1 Thessalonians 5.14 says like this. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idol, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. It's talking about the body, right? It's talking about the church, the Thessalonians, the church in Thessalonica. You got you to gotta encourage the, the, the brothers, admonish the idol, the people that are not doing anything, admonish them, encourage them to do something, encourage the faint-hearted, people that have weak faith, people that don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, encourage them. Help the weak and be patient with them all. For about a month and a half, I have had, I had some back pain. I woke up one day, my wife uh, went to go visit some family in, in, in um, Panama, her country, and I stayed with my son. My son is three. He's being potty trained, right? So y'all continue to pray for me. And uh, I, I, I wake up and I felt a little twinge, like my, my back felt just tight, you know, just tight. But I'm a man, so that doesn't bother me. So I go and, and, and I, I pick my son up because, again, he's being potty trained. And I'm going to go sit him on the toilet. And I'm, I'm, as I'm bending down, my back just gave out. And I dropped him on the toilet. So my son looks up at me. He goes, ow. And I said, ow. You know, it's my back. It's my back that's hurt. And I was like, man, that's, that's weird. I don't know what's going on. Right, but again, I'm a man, so I do what a man does, and I just walk it off, right? Just rub some dirt on it, like, you're fine. Matter of fact, I have a saying, and I tell it to my wife all the time, if something hurts, use it more. So I'm sitting there trying to stretch, you know, but it was not helping. And I would go to rehearsal, and I'm carrying around the drum set, and, and I'm, I told Cody, I was like, man, my back is just, I don't know what's going on. It's just not getting better. Every day I'd wake up the same pain. So it started spreading from the left side to the, to the right side. And so now I'm getting worried. It's been about a month, and nothing is helping. So I go to Dr. Pinterest, and as I'm looking at Dr. Pinterest, it's telling me some stretches that I have to do to help my lower back pain. So I'm, I'm, I'm at home, and I'm doing these stretches. One of them is called the frog pose. Don't look it up. But my wife walks in, and she's like, what are you doing? And, and I said, I have to, my back hurts, so I'm, I'm trying to release the hips. It wasn't working. So I continue looking, and I'm like, I don't know. I'm going to have to go see somebody. And it always hurt more when I sat down. So as I'm doing my research, it turns out that the problem was that I have weak hip flexors, a.k.a. you're 38, do some sit-ups. And so my, my hip flexors are weak, and it was affecting my back, wow. right? So these weak muscles here affected back here. So what do I have to do? I have to strengthen the muscles here so then this can now not have pain. Do you see how this works? When people in the body of Christ are in pain and they're weak, if you just choose to neglect them, cut them off and say, man, I, want nothing. I can't believe this brother's believing like this. You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to admonish them, encourage them, pick them up. The ones that are faint-hearted and doing nothing, you're supposed to tell them, do something and don't be faint-hearted. Let me fill you with some faith that I have that you may not so that you can be strengthened and we can function well together. This is for us. This is for Radiant City. This is for the body right here, right? None of this beautiful kind of love would be possible if there was no idle, no faint-hearted or weak. I can't encourage anybody if nobody's weak. If we're all in the same faith, I can't encourage you. You can't feed off my faith, and I can't feed off of yours. So it shows the dependency that we have on one another. God shows up and he shows off through the body of believers with different amounts of faith. That's what he does. So now this starts to point to the need for disciples to be a part of the body of Christ. I hear it all the time. I don't believe in organized religion. Hey, man, what works for you, that's good. But I don't believe in that. You know, I trust and I pray to God and I read my Bible on my own. I, I really used to not have an answer for that. I, I didn't know what to say. I knew that the church was beneficial for me, but a lot of times I would see the hurt that the church would cause. I could see how, how not, going to a church that's cold-hearted, turning their back on the needy. Right, so the church, there's a saying that, that uh, uh, pastor, uh, I used to pastor with in Texas, he would say all the time, the church is the only place that kills our wounded. 
And I've seen that so many times and heard the stories. So I can see why people say, I want nothing to do with organized religion. I've been hurt. Church hurt is real. But Paul is telling us we need one another. Let's look at verses 4 and 5. For as in one body, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Here we see that our God-given gifts are all for one. All these gifts are for one body. Radiant City, the church is called to use all of their spiritual gifts to serve one body because we all belong to one another. We're individuals that belong to one. I can't say I want nothing to do with my toe. Anybody ever step on a Lego? Or hit the side of the bedpost with their pinky toe? The pinky toe is insignificant until that happens. Then you are limping. Everything hurts. You are taking your Christian suit off and you're just saying everything to put it back on so that you can say, wow, that really hurt. It's just, it's painful. We all need to serve one another with our gifts. We all belong to one body. One person hurts, we all hurt. We are not called to live this life Alone, because together is when we honor and glorify Christ by loving one another as he loved us. Well, how did he love us? He gave himself up to the cross. Now, I don't know how many of you are willing to take a bullet from me. Depending on who you are, how much time I've spent with you, joking, we will run together. That's fine. I, we, we, I'll try to help you. I'll try. The way we honor Christ is by being together, glorifying him, loving one another as he has loved us. But how do you do that? How do we do that? How do we love one another? I've heard this before, Will, love one another, we should love one another, yes, yeah, but how do I do that? You use your gifts. But Will, what gifts do I have? I don't know my gifts. I've been coming to church for a while and I've heard about these, but I don't say nothing because I don't really know what my gifts are. And I've taken the spiritual gift test you know, hey, do you love people? Yes, because I know I have to say that on the test. So in the end, those results are skewed. They're not right. And it really depends on how you woke up that morning. If you woke up feeling generous, all of a sudden your gift is generosity. But when you're broke, you're not generous. <laughs> so that's not the gift, is it? It's, you, how do, so, so Will, okay, what are my gifts then? How do I f- figure out what they are? Listen. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, and Ephesians 4 all talk about spiritual gifts, and still these lists lists are not exhaustive. What I mean is there are gifts that you may have and talents that you may have that are not listed here that can be utilized within the body. But in the end, we understand, you have to understand, we all must understand Through our God-given gifts, we are one, one individual for all people. So how do I use what even isn't listed on there to serve God? Okay, There's no set number of spiritual gifts. There are no boundaries or separate packages of spiritual gifts where if you have one, you can't have another one. Okay, So, so, So if I have the gift of teaching, there's nothing that says I can't have the gift of exhortation or generosity, or I can play drums, and I can teach, or I can, I'm a great artist, and I can also dance, or I, I'm great with numbers, but I'm also really good at encouraging those that are, that are broken. I always find the words to say, I don't know how. That's a gift. That's a talent that you are to utilize within the body. You have to leave it to God on how he's going to use you. Your combination of gifts, it will be very different from everyone else's. Everyone will be totally different. You can like the same things, but everybody's gifts are going to be different. And utilized differently. We have to leave it to God to see how that's going to be used. Let's go ahead and read verse 6. And then I'm going to, this is going to take a little bit of time because I felt like I needed to just harp on this one verse for a little bit. Just to kind of break it down and help us understand. 
Verse 6. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith. Now, that word prophecy may cause some people to squirm in their seats. Prophecy. Ooh. Oh, something to skip over that. We'll just read it and keep on going. Uh, in certain circles, that's a, that's a no-no word. We don't, we don't say prophecy. That's not a good thing. But listen, we have to understand what Paul is talking about when we talk about prophecy. It's not so much talking about things that come in the future. It's also not so much about teaching or preaching. I used to believe that prophecy, the the prophet was the person that came to the front and delivered the word of God. And that person was the prophet and no one else. I used to believe that. That is not so much the case. As I continued reading the word of God, I was able to understand what prophecy really is. See, in the Old Testament, prophecy was an office. Right? There was a prophet that would come in to a certain place or a certain people, and he delivered to them a word from God. He would normally start out with saying, thus saith the Lord, and then fill in the blank with whatever it is. There's whole books devoted to these prophets and what they said. A lot of times, it wasn't good things. Matter of fact, when Samuel would show up, prophet Samuel would show up, and he'd be like, do you bring good news? Are you coming in peace? Because if you're not, I'm going on vacation. I want nothing to do with what you're about to say. And he would say, no, peace, peace. And, okay, good, then, then I'm, I'll stay. I'll, I'll, I'll do a staycation. I'll stay here instead. Okay? But usually it was a word from God. It was a warning or something that they had to do. It was an office specifically for a person. However, in the New Testament, we see something that, uh, that shows us that anybody who has the Holy Spirit of God is able to experience prophecy. Here's what I mean. Paul starts out in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, and he says, And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. See, prophecy has a purpose within the body of Christ. So anyone who has the Holy Spirit can prophesy. And I'll I'll explain what that means. So don't get crazy. Okay. If you have the Holy Spirit of God, anyone here can proclaim the word of God. Okay. 1 Corinthians 14 verses 1 through 4 says like this. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. This is a good thing. Desire that. Want that. Especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God. For no one understands him. But he utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for the upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds himself up, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Prophecy in the body of Christ exists to upbuild, encourage, and console the body as a whole. If I come with the word of God, and I'm explaining to you what sin is, you should feel revulsion to sin, and it should drive you to repentance. That is prophecy. I am prophesying the word of God. Prophecy is where God brings something to the mind of a believer, a revelation. Oh, he used the word revelation. Oh, no, it's it's getting thick now. 1 Corinthians 14, 30 to 31 says this. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For, all, for you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all be encouraged. Amen. What it's saying is Gus may have a revelation or something that he, he read in the Word of God. Man, I read chapter 12 in Romans yesterday, and I just felt like this is a word for our church. And then Cody will come and be like, yeah, I also read chapter 12, and specifically verse 6 is saying this. And then Mary may come and say, yeah, but did you see verse 8? Now we're all talking about the Word of God. This is all prophecy. Why? Because the Spirit of God is taking us somewhere. He's taking us to understand something as a body. And now we can, we can all encourage and console and upbuild the body as a whole. That is the purpose of prophecy. So 
We have to use prophecy in proportion to our faith. And all that is saying is that you use this to exalt and glorify Jesus in proportion to our faith, meaning what we believe to be saved. That is our faith. If I believe that Jesus is the only way to salvation, then I'm going to prophesy according to that. If I believe that Jesus is, he he died and rose again so that we can all be redeemed and be with him for all eternity, then I will prophesy that because that is in accordance to our faith. So we prophesy to upbuild, encourage, and console the body of Christ. So can we all have the gift of prophecy? Not only can we, we do. Because the Holy Spirit uses it as he sees fit in the moments necessary. Now let's look at verses 7 through 8. Let's look at verses 7 through 8. And it says, If service in serving, the one who teaches in teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness, so the question now becomes, what do, how do, do all these gifts work, and what do they look like for Radiant City Church? Well, serving, serving. Let's talk about serving for a second. And I feel like as I was reading this, it, it ended up becoming a prayer there towards the end. Like, I now understand that it is because of my faith in Christ that I'm able to think differently. And because I'm able to think differently, I can now serve differently. I can love differently, walk differently, act differently, behave differently, be different, and conforming to Jesus Christ. So now the prayer becomes for the church. So I understand this. I want to serve, but I need those that are next to me to serve with me. Because I need to serve you guys. I need to love you guys. I need you guys to love me. Build me up so I can build you up. Right? And we need to do this. So so the prayer now becomes... Verses 7 through 8, in serving, the prayer is that a small army of people who aren't seeking attention but have the gift of service would joyfully serve wherever there is a need. Whether it's setting a pipe and drape, whether it's cleaning out the dumpsters because they feel a burden to take action. So you want to know where you're called to serve? You want to know what your gift is? What are you burdened to do? That's your gift. If it's more than one thing, You have more than one gift. (laughs) Hey, I'm I'm tired of seeing them setting up the pipe and drape. I see the same three people do it. I really need to do that. Then do it. Take action. You're not seeking the limelight? Come and serve. Mm. Something's bothering you. You don't know people are not parking properly out in the parking lot? Go serve. (laughs) All right? (laughs) The the, the coffee is a little too light. Go serve. (laughs) Right? You, you come a little hungry in the morning, serve, right? Like, I will not reject food. That, that's okay. I have the gift of eatage, right? That's, I love it. I love it. Okay? But my prayer is that God will lift up an army that sees a need and says we need to serve to fill that need. I don't need my name on a plaque. We just need to serve. How about teaching, the gift of teaching? Radiant City, I want Radiant City to be a place where anyone who learns anything about God feels a burden to take what they've learned and teach it to someone else. Whether they're a believer or not, you show up at work, they don't believe the way that you do, but I heard this word at church, I need you to hear it. Man, you know I exist to serve you, I exist to love you, I am one, but I exist to serve all. You're part of all. So I'm going to serve you, I'm going to show you who Jesus is, and that person looking at you like you're crazy. What did you eat? But the more you serve, the more they see who Jesus is, and the more they see who you belong to. And then when you bring them here, they're able to see, man, they love each other so much. They really do belong to a father. They have the same father. So you teach what you learn so that also the next generation would continue to do the same. And then we continue to make disciples of Jesus. More disciples are now formed because you chose to teach. But Will, I don't really know the word of God. Hey, learn so that you can teach. I don't feel like I have the gift of teaching. If you can tell somebody how to boil water, you can teach. It's not hard. You don't need to use big words. You just need to be dedicated and devoted to Christ. How about the gift of exhortation? 
where Radiant City would have an army of disciples that feel the burden to give encouraging words and uplift and restore rather than tear down and beat down. When they hear gossip, they say, no, 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 no. If that brother or sister is not here to defend themselves and we can encourage him, then let's not talk about them. That is not what we need to do because the body of Christ exhorts. That is a gift that we all have because we all have the Spirit. Through the gift of exhortation, those that feel inadequate can be reminded that Jesus has set them apart for his glory. There are many times when I walk around people and they just feel so down in the dumps. I tell you, I'll be honest with you, this is not a gift that comes easily for me. Sometimes I just have, I'm sorry. I, f- I feel for you. I will pray with you. I'll pray for you. I don't have words to say. Sometimes that's exhortation enough, though. Let's, let's be that church that exhorts, that builds up, that doesn't tear down, but builds up, that consoles, that encourages. How about contribution, contributing? That we, I pray that we are a church that has the gift of giving so that we feel a burden to give and give generously with joy to those in need and to the expansion of the kingdom of God to exalt and glorify Christ. Now, I want to give a, a small disclaimer here. You don't need to be rich to do this. My grandmother would, would she go to Dollar Tree and she'd be looking and she'd be buying stuff and she had her little purse and she'd, and she'd just start grabbing stuff and then I, I I just drove her. I was the taxi. I didn't ask questions. But then I'd see her show up at church, and she'd be like, hey, give this to so-and-so. Give this to so-and-so. So-and-so, I'm giving them three towels. Go ahead. And give. And she would constantly just be giving people stuff just because. That's giving. That's the gift of giving. She didn't know if they needed towels or not, but she just felt like she had to do it. My father is the same way. He just give him, hey, you want a banana? No one asked you for food. No one said they were hungry. I just want to give, right? That's the gift of giving. Just give you everything. You don't need to be rich to do it. How about contributing time? Time is expensive. Time is money. Contribute time. Give it generously. All right, I I got one more, and then we're finishing up. The gift of mercy Let Radiant City be the church where saints who have the gift of mercy feel and continue to feel the burden of showing mercy to the poor, the lost, and the broken. That's a gift that I see so much lack in because we're so inward focused. It's it's really kind of all about me. What are my gifts? What can I do for the kingdom? Instead of what can we do, how can we show love and show mercy to the broken and the lost and the poor and those that just need a word of truth. This isn't a fantasy or a dream church. This already exists in Radiant City. If you call yourself a follower of Jesus, if you are a disciple of Jesus, you have all of these gifts and then some, but we have to let ourselves be utilized by the Spirit of God to take what we have and pour it out into the people. And I'll finish with this. Those who have not yet come to saving faith in Jesus Christ, I pray that you realize that this life disconnected from Jesus means lonely, burdensome, and loveless life. However far you feel that you are from Jesus, he will always be one decision away from you being able to receive his unconditional love, his grace, and his mercy and for you to belong to a part of the body of Christ, the body of believers who are prepared to love you the way that Jesus loves you. Now, to those of us who already are followers of Christ, we're not made to live this life alone. We exist to love one another as Christ loves us so that all the world will know that we belong to him. After all, this is Jesus' commandment for us. And we have all been gifted to love each other well. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity that we've had to hear your word, your truth. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, that those of us that are sitting in this room and hearing this message, wherever we are, wherever we may be, 
Lord, that we're reminded of who you are, what you've done for us, and that it stirs us to serve one another well in love, using the gifts that you've given us, using the knowledge that we have, using our upbringing, using our experiences so that you overall are glorified and exalted and that the world may see that we belong to you and the world may see that the only way to be saved is through the power of your cross and what you've done, Lord. I ask you in Jesus' name that you convict us, Lord. In those moments when we want to shy away from doing the things that you called us to do, that you shake us powerfully so that we do what what you're calling us to do, that we're obedient to your word, Father. Continue to speak to us, Lord, as we prepare to worship your beautiful name together as one body. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.